Hello and welcome to NewsClick's International Roundup. On May 26, Prime Minister Narendra Modi's NDA government completed four years in power. To talk more about the performance of the government in the field of international affairs, we have with us Prabir Purkayasa, founding editor NewsClick. Hello, Prabir. So, Prabir, uh, Modi's government over the past four years, the kind of publicity it has done has actually talked a lot about how India's prestige on the global stage has increased. It has become a global player. Is there any truth to it at all? You know, India has always been a global player, even where it has been in a much weaker economic and military political position, if you will. Just after independence, India should have been a relatively backward country. It didn't have the kind of clout, for instance, the global powers had, <coughs> including the big colonial powers then France, of course, UK, and Soviet Union and uh, United States at the time. India really played a far bigger role than what it's otherwise, what it's uh, economic and size may have given it at that point of time. Of course, in terms of population, it was always very big. What we see is over a period of time, India has actually ceded a lot of its global credibility, if you will, global maneuverability, if you will, and certainly the kind of voice it had in international affairs. India, in fact, hardly makes a noise on any of the big issues that take place in the world, or the world today, whether it's Ukraine, whether it is Syria, whether it is uh, Iran, whether it is, of course, Israel and Palestine, even if it makes certain noises, for instance, when it did about the South China Sea and all, it appears to be very much related to India's immediate concern and, shall we say, narrow maneuvering within a certain space. So I think it's fair to say that India today seems to count for far less than it did in earlier years. Even uh, if we say 20 years, 25 years back, if we take the WTO negotiations, international issues, there was a sort of G77 group, which India was a much more important player. And it is because it headed, if, if we will, along with certain other countries, that it headed this G77, it was able to make its voice heard. Over a period of time, and this is really the uh, huge number of so-called strategic experts who seem to be in uh, various think tanks created by the United States have been arguing India should look after its self-interest, trying to talk about non-alignment, G77 is not the issue, it should look as if it is only itself and see what's the best bargain it can reach. So it gave up its international clout for the so-called uh, bargain that it could reach within countries like that. So I think the decline of US, India as an international force is really predicated on this self-interest model that it has developed and that it should bargain with different countries. and. Post 1990, with the fall of the socialist bloc, in the belief that therefore it should come close to the United States as only global hegemon. Modi initially did try to do certain things, uh, but it continued with this al aligning itself with the United States. We know that a large number of uh, agreements have been signed. It is the largest number of groups that have been set up to discuss each other's integration, if you will. It militarily, it has signed onto some documents, some agreements which seem to be integrated itself within the United States larger military framework. And it is negotiating right now with the United States for a further uh, uh, integration with uh, what is called uh, the ability to look at how the satellite signals okay. will be used. Uh, which also makes nonsense of what it is setting up itself, its own geospatial satellites that it has sent up. And then also uh, being able to integrate this communication infrastructure, military communication infrastructure within that of the United States, both of which are extremely dangerous right. in a long term sense. So I think one part of it is giving up its strategic vision and uh, second part of it De deciding that with the most powerful military player being the United States, it needs to integrate as much as it can. In the last few months, there is a recognition that 
the United States is willing to take from India, integrate it, but it's not going to give much in return. So given that scenario, whether it United States can give or not give is a different issue, but certainly not doesn't seem to be willing to give much in return and in fact ratcheting up the screws on various other issues. So I think there is a belated recognition of that and therefore uh, some in independent moves now to not cling so close to the US coattails, which particularly after the first year's first year was very visible in the next second third year uh, and much of the fourth year. Only now I think last three months we seem to see a little more flexibility in India's policy and therefore talking with China uh, on the issue of Palestine though it has supported Israel broadly but it has also voted against it on the issue of Jerusalem. Some, some uh, attempts to uh, retrieve some lost ground as it were but broadly it still remains very close to United States and it's certainly not willing to take responsibility for any independent positioning of itself in world affairs and that I think is the basic reason why the Modi uh, foreign policy has I think largely put India in a much worse situation than when he began. And you mentioned Israel right now for instance so the Modi government is really accelerated and strengthened ties with Israel and this marks a very drastic, not a very drastic shift from the previous Congress government maybe, but from the previous decades of Indian policy on this issue. So is there any likelihood of uh, a recovery in this area as far as we are concerned or are we headed towards uh, uh, even further strengthening of ties with Israel? Well, I think the distinct shift that the Modi government has made that it has identified Zionism and Hindutva as twin entities which therefore need to support each other. So it's an ideological aligning that it has done. The fact that it has gone to founding fathers of Israel, uh, it has talked about therefore of things it shares with Israel and really what it shares with Israel is uh, the identity, the Jewish identity right. base as a basis of nationalism. So any Jew anywhere as you know in the world can be a citizen of Israel. But somebody who has stayed in that piece of land for 2000 years is alien okay. by the definition that Israel would like to have because they are saying it is basically a Jewish state. So this, this kind of things of the Jewish state versus the what Hindutva would like to create in India as a Hindu state, the obvious uh, shall we say matching of wavelengths. This is what I think distinguishes the, uh, the, this government from its earlier governments. As we know, Israel has successfully corrupted our defense procurement system. There have been enough cases of this count, people have been arraigned. Uh, there have been cases abroad, including in Israel, on the corruption that the Israel um, Armed Forces industry has done in India. But in spite of that, the uh, pace at which it continues to buy arms seems only to increase. So that's the that's, uh, other part that we see. And also abandoning some of India's independent attempts to develop technology, not in all areas, but certainly in certain areas like, for instance, in the missiles. We must also understand this integration with the United States is also facilitated by integration with Israel <coughs> because Israel and the United States have a very close and integrated armaments industry. So in fact, what is happening is the A team, B team model that you buy from US directly, you also buy from the B team of the United States, which is Israel, as a, as a whole bunch of arms. And then of course, you are dependent on both of these for any serious uh, future engagement. Interestingly, Russia, which has been a major supply of arms, and it has been shown recently that the Russian arms are quite good. In fact, in Syria, they have shown that their uh, air defense system is probably better than anything else in the world has seen. It's been able to intercept uh, two thirds of the missiles that were launched, right. essentially launched by the Israelis using uh, mostly American uh, arms, arms. All of that it was able to, two thirds of it it was able to intercept, include the Tomahawk missiles, right. the cruise missiles. So I think that uh, we are really going in for a far more expensive procurement process. Well, Russia has 10% of the budget of the United States. So talking of another global player, India's relationship with China has also been 
very uneven during this period. I mean, there's with the Doklam standoff was there and also uh, even China's attempts at, uh, what do you call, expanding or say exp increasing its zone of influence through the One Belt, One Road initiative. India has been one of the countries which has uh, stayed away from even the possibility of further trade relations. So, is, a, is it a sustainable method of going forward, maintaining this stance of confrontation with China or if not confrontation at least? Uh, lack of engagement. What we have seen in this period is almost the absence of the Foreign Office mm -hmm. and its preparations uh, creating a certain set of issues which we'll engage with and then the visit. Instead, Modi seems to decide today I need to make a foreign visit, decides which country it has, he has to go to and then visits the country. I think he's made many more visits than any other Prime yeah, Minister in the past. So 53 countries so far, the number of kilometers traveled, etc., etc. In, in, in Chinese case, it was interesting that he thought a personal summit will solve all the issues and this charm offensive will uh, actually bring India dividends. Big countries do not operate on that basis. They are not small players who are sort of overwhelmed by charm and the red carpet and the, what shall we say, the atmospherics that you build around it, around the visit. They are really looking at what are the issues, how do you engage, what do we engage on and how far should we go. These are the hard-headed uh, calls that any country makes and particularly the size of India and China. That is the way we should ex expect any engagement to take place. The first visit took place, the first trade visit took place and was uh, the banks of Sabarmati and Ahmedabad. All these discussions are going on. We had a standoff at that very instance on the Indo China, India China border. And that led to very bad, shall we say, outcome that right. nothing really happened. Why did we have that standoff? What were the reasons for it? Was it something which was avoidable? Was it something that the Chinese had uh, done? Was it something that we had done? That still remains to be uh, seen. But it is unlikely that uh, both sides should have had such a high visibility visit and that, that, that there was uh, something which got in the way which could not be stopped. Even there was something that had happened, I think there was enough at that point of time uh, preparation we could have made to see that this does not derail the visit. Then we had the Doklam standoff which uh, as you know uh, did mean India got some cosmetic uh, shall we say uh, uh, gestures from China, but on the ground we have accepted what the Chinese were saying all along. That's that's more or less there. And after Doklam, we tried to play tough. We tried to get in with the the United States, talked even of quadrilateral uh, arrangements. Though we did issue separate press statements from the other partners of the Quad, as it were. I think the Belt Road Initiative is one of the most important economic initiatives on the Eurasian continent. It is something unlike a sea trade. It needs cooperation between all the countries participating because if one country does it, then the entire Belt Road can at that point of time become a bottleneck. So this is also, this also makes it much more of a cooperative venture than what other uh, trading ventures would be, which as I said are on the sea, it's a, you have a direct access because the sea is supposed to be open sea. So I think India has made a big mistake of keeping out of it, thinking that they will uh, act, they will not be a part of a trading block like this, which will be created around this Belt Road Initiative, but they will be able to create a separate block by themselves. You know, our road initiative, for instance, with Burma, Myanmar, is not uh, really, uh, we are not covering ourselves with glory. It is not proceeding the way it should have been. Uh, Myanmar is telling us, keep, please do something. Why is the road not being built? We keep on telling them every year another two years. So this gift gets on getting postponed. Well, the Chinese actually do deliver. We have the same issue in Sri Lanka. We right. don't deliver on the promises we make. It gets postponed and then we find all kinds of reasons why they, we cannot do it anymore. Well, China seems to deliver on its promises. So already we have that credibility gap in question. India was supposed to have a road to Bar Bar Myanmar and connect to Southeast Asia. Well, the Burma route is not taking place. We have to understand that if there is competition, there is also cooperation. 
and I don't think international relations today, it's an either or principle. Almost all countries compete as well as collaborate. India on China went into post Doklam even before onto this tough stance, military promise. We will you know, talk about we can fight a two front war uh, while at the same time we say that we don't have enough ammunition to last two weeks. So all of this is, is not making India's position with China very, uh, shall we say, very cordial. India's external affairs ministry has been more or less sidelined in the Modi's foreign tours. And that's also one of the reasons the preparation, the support, the professionalism which the Indian external affairs ministry has, has not been put to use. I hope at least in China's case that changes. And actually on a related note, one of the uh, uh, fascinating or interesting aspects of Modi's foreign policy has been that, uh, in a negative sense of course, about how he's basically used foreign policy and foreign trips to pursue domestic politics. And no other Indian Prime Minister so far has done that. All his foreign trips have been extended campaign uh, meetings, so to speak. So uh, that dangerous, that's actually a very dangerous trend which has very, uh, which is a very problematic effect for both for domestic and foreign policy actually. Well, I think there's the other part of it which also needs to be said that when he goes to England, for instance, it is to the, shall we say, the overseas Indian community. Exactly. When he goes to United States, it's the overseas uh, American Indian community. So Modi's foreign policy seems to be directed more at the diaspora than at the at the foreign powers themselves. Right. And uh, other other part of it is the belief that if you go and talk nice, then people will be nice with you. Uh, in the whole, uh, shall we say, uh, the belief that uh, foreign policy is about your self-interest as a country, and what is it? What is it that you want from others? and what they will give you depends whether their self-interest and our self-interest coincides. Right. Of course, it's a very narrow view. There is a larger view. What is your position in world affairs? How do you look at other countries? How do you look at global affairs? But I think you are right that Modi has tended to see foreign policy very much to an internal policy prism and therefore how much mileage you will get at home. Right and how much mileage he will get to the overseas oh, Indians, which has been a very strong BJP constituency mm -hmm. and who have also given in a huge amount of money right. in terms of, uh, shall we say, election funds, in terms of supporting the various BJP organizations on the ground. So that constituency is what he seems to be nurturing right. as much as India's foreign policy. Thank you, Prabir. That's all we have time for today. Keep watching News Click.